This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and not the other one. Hello and welcome to episode 93 of Partners in Crime. We had a week off last week, uh, but we are back this week. And when I say we, I mean me, because Mr. Dawes is still on tour. But that man over there with the bacon roll is Mr. Adrian Hobart. Hello, Adrian. Hi, Adam. Nice to speak to you again. It's been a long time. Yes, it has. Yes. Thank you for swallowing before we spoke. Um, it was much appreciated. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bob currently on tour um, with 10 Times Table. He was in Edinburgh last week, is in York this week. So um, quite unobtainable. He has sent um, a report, though, which we will um, possibly use on this week's show or next week's show. We'll see how we're, how we're doing for time. Um First thing I was going to say is we had an email from uh, Marion Todd. If you want to get in touch with us, by the way, we are hello at partnersincrime.online. She was referring to an episode um, a couple of weeks back where Bob decided he was doing his um, American satin nav voice, which she said made her laugh. And she says, <laughs> I live in Scotland and have English Jane on mine. It's difficult to explain just how wrong she gets Scottish place names, and I'll spare you the awkward pronunciation, but she does make some epic mistakes, Marion says. Uh, her favourites are St Andrews, which her sat nav announces is Street Andrews. And the fourth road bridge becomes a fourth road branch. And she says, I can't possibly sell the car uh, in case the next one doesn't have Jane. So I'll have to run her into the ground. Keep up the good work. I'm loving have, having so many episodes to listen to while I glug tea from my partners in crime mug. Um, so, yes, always very nice to hear from the listeners. We know you're out there, so do feel free to get in touch. Um, Adrian, what have you been um, watching, reading, doing recently? I'll start with watching, shall I? And this is a very left field thing to suggest in terms of crime. But it strikes me that in the guise of one of the most famous science fiction franchises there is, Star Trek, the new series Picard launched. Patrick Stewart announced it a couple of years ago, and it's finally launched on Amazon Prime in this country, and I think it's on CBS in the States. Um, the fact is that it's a crime story. It starts with a murder, and he then... Yeah. Uh, goes around, uh, there's a crime scene, it's an investigation scene in episode two, which uh, was frankly ridiculous, but <laughs> nonetheless, it was very, very much, it's a detective <laughs> series, essentially. And uh, only in episode three, as he said, engage for the first time and actually gone out into space. But basically, yeah, it's a mis murder mystery with Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard. And um, it's it's just bizarre. I mean, it's much slower than you would expect in a Star Trek story because it's obviously over a bigger arc, and, uh, mm. uh, and they're certainly dwelling on the human scenes. It's it's you know Patrick Stewart's peerless in it, um, but a lot of people are criticising the pace of the program and the fact that it's not sci-fi enough. But that is my crime recommendation mm. on telly for now. Yeah, well, I wasn't uh, wasn't expecting that one. No, I know, <laughs> and it only occurred to me, you know, because I was watching it going. <laughs> Oh, here we go again. Another bit of detective work and, uh, you know, looking at the uh, the forensics. It, it's very, very strange to see it um, done that way. But, you know, it's it's always nice to see Patrick Stewart and doing anything, really. Mm, absolutely, yeah. So you have a book recommendation as well, you were saying. Yes, I do. Now, look, I, I'll confess, I'm one of these people who has to, you know, because of the limits of time I've got, uh, all the things I'm I'm up to at the moment, I like to dip in and dip out. So I found an anthology, which mm. was uh, published last year. Uh, it's called Mids Murder in Midsummer. And it's an anthology on, let me just check, um, profile books, which has some of the greats, some of the golden age uh, writers and some of the more modern um, writers. So you've got uh, short stories from Dorothy L. Sayers, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, as well as Ruth Rendell, for example. Um, I'm loving it because, you know, it, it's one of those things where it can introduce me to a whole load of writers I haven't yet uh, touched on, which I feel, given that mm. I'm a co-presenter on this podcast every so often, a little bit um, uh, sort of uh, 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 imposter syndrome there that I haven't read uh, as many as I should, <laughs> but this is a way into it. And I, I think it's fantastic. Some really well-chosen stories. 
Well, the, the partners in crime way is fake it till you make it. So don't worry about that. Um, and short stories are very, very in at the moment, apparently, which is um, nice because I've got a few out myself. Um, so hopefully uh, they will pick up. But yeah, apparently it's um, it's something that's very, very in at the moment. I uh, I wasn't aware of that. Right. Uh, is that time pressed people needing short stories? Is that is that what's driven it? Is it audio perhaps? Maybe so. Maybe so. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there at the moment. There's a lot of new writers. A lot of crime. There's more books out there than there's ever been. So yeah, maybe it's um, as you say. It's a way of being introduced to new writers. So um, there we are. Um, I noticed as I was looking on the news this week um, uh, an article, a very interesting article, on the blog of David Mark, who um, is a, a, a very popular crime writer he's uh, appeared on partners in crime as well so have a look for that episode if you haven't listened to it um he um has announced that he is no longer working with his publisher and he is going to publish his books uh, independently which is something that um, i've always done um he says on his blog um in 2011 my dark novel dark uh, my novel dark winter was something of a hit it did well at home and abroad and the critics said lovely things david says uh, publishers took me out for boozy dinners and crime festivals paid me to come and talk entertaining b words about how it felt to achieve my ambitions val mcdermid said i was exciting which came as something of a shock a decade on, he says, I've written another 10 books. I've been in the running for awards, written for Radio 4, had a book adapted for the stage and come damn close to getting an adaptation of my DS McAvoy series onto TV. Um, he continues, I've met my literary heroes, offended far fewer of them than I would have expected, seen the world and managed to spaff quite a lot of money up the wall. And in February 2020, after eight books in the McAvoy series, my publishers have decided not to continue. Um, he mm. it's quite interesting actually where he lays the blame for this and I completely um, see his point and agree he says I suppose it's impossible to argue with spreadsheets and accountants but there are reasons why certain books didn't make Tesco and Amazon the money these mercantile behemoths were expecting if you put up uh, a book by a relative unknown against a heavily discounted release by an A-lister chances are that customers will take the safe bet Unfortunately, the lesser-known author, who didn't shift all their copies, ends up with a big black mark next to their name, rendering them largely toxic next time the salespeople for the big publishing houses try to persuade the supermarkets to put their next book on the shelves. As such, the mid-lister's star loses whatever shine it briefly had, and publishers decide to give their money to the next debut author who hasn't had their brand tarnished. Um, yeah, very interesting, very uh, surprising news from from David, um, and it's something I did want to kind of touch on because I know Adrian, you've um, you're kind of dipping your toes into the uh, the publishing world as well, aren't you this year? Absolutely, yeah. You, you can probably see both sides of it. I'm guessing, then you can see that um, you know, from authors' points of view, as a as a writer yourself, um, how delicate things might be, and and how kind of. Um, I guess soulless it might appear working with the publisher, and also you can, I guess, see the the business side from uh, from the publisher's point of view, can't you? Uh, I can. Well, look, I'm, I'm I'm sort of wearing two hats. So yes, you say I'm writing, and I'm not quite to market yet, but getting closer. And I'm I'm uh, working with my partner Rebecca to to launch Hobet Books, which is a publisher which is aiming to offer uh, authors a much much better deal and and sort of. Uh, deal of care, I suppose, and, and taking a longer term view of development. And, and in terms of the people that we're working with at the moment, some are established, but uh, one or two are complete unknowns. Just it's it's more a hunch, really, um, knowing them as people and their sort of creative talents and, and knowing that, you know, we're taking a massive financial risk, but it's worth it in the long term. But I think publishers and, and I can see this. I mean, Rebecca works in the in the traditional industry as well. Just mm. how not mercenary i think it's 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 become it's got to the point now where they can't afford to make mistakes in their view in the sense that if it doesn't sell that black mark is is overwhelming now so i do understand where he's coming from and i think that it's a brave move but at the same time to have control over your destiny uh as you do mm. adam and the way you publish mm. um it's, it's got to be the the paradigm but the the, the problem for a lot of people is They've got to have a day job and to put in the time you need to develop a readership, to market, to, to keep on top of things, to run deals um, in different 
you know, retailers and that sort of thing, uh, takes a lot of time. And especially the the marketing assets take so much time and so much skill and so much learning to to to, to get to the point where you're you're ahead of the game and and ahead of the the competition. But having said that, I mm-hmm. I I personally have never considered when I started writing ever going the traditional route because mm-hmm. it just doesn't yeah. appeal to me. And I think that the no. the percentage that, that people get paid is a pittance. I think it's I think it's dreadful mm-hmm. unless you're one of the big super names. I, I think you know people are really, really struggling. Yeah, well, I guess the um, benefit of being a new publisher and having um, looked at things from a different angle is that you can pay authors a better rate because you are setting your 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 shop up in a different way. I guess you're not going down that traditional route of of you know, spending all the money by taking people out to expensive lunches at the Ivy every other day, for example, and um, yeah. disappearing off to, to fairs and things like this, you know, trying to get hold of a, a publisher when, you know, there's basically any time between about March and October, you're not going to get hold of them because they're going to be at Frankfurt or they're going to be at LBF and they're going to be disappearing all over the place. <laughs> they're going to be totally um, <laughs> <Yeah>. unresponsive. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess setting things up in a different way um, rather than kind of adjusting from how things have been coming into it in 2020 and saying, look, this is the way the world is now. This is the way the industry is now and doing things differently, I think is, um, is refreshing. Yeah. And, and I hope it works. And, you know, it's a lot of faith uh, involved in, in doing something like this. Yes, it is. Yep. All new businesses are, but so yeah, wish you the very best of luck with that. We'll certainly keep our eyes open. Um, Speaking of David Mark, his new book, um, Blood Money, is out now. It's available for £2.99. So um, do uh, get a copy of that. He's also got uh, Still Waters coming up as well, uh, which is the first uh, in a new trilogy. So, um, yep, big um, New Horizons for David Mark. Please do support him. Um, Brilliant author and lovely bloke too. Um, It leads me on, actually, to an article I saw in The Eye this week. Um, Val McDermott um, was interviewed ahead of her new novel, How the Dead Speak, which is the 11th um, Tony Hill and Carol Jordan book. Uh, She did um, wonder if... Pardon me. If Insidious Intent, her last one, um, might be the final one, but she has decided to uh, to carry on after the the massive um, twist at the end of that book. Um, She said... You know, it says here in this article anyway, which I'm going to read out word for word because it's easier than paraphrasing. Uh, it says, McDermott is conscious that publishing is a harsher industry than it was when she started in the late 80s. I took 10 years to be an overnight sensation, she says. These days, if you haven't broken out by your third book, you're not going to have much of a career. The industry fetishizes novelty, but writers need time to develop. Giving a seven-figure advance to a debut is a terrible thing to do to a writer. Um, so, yeah, that kind of feeds in, I guess, to um, to what David Mark was saying and mm-hmm. what you were saying there, Adrian. That um, you know, we're always looking for the next big thing, and people get dropped very quickly. But any writer needs time to bed in, and all of the big names haven't been instant overnight sensations. They've taken a a long time to. Um, I guess, to bed in and to build popularity. And they're the ones that, that stick around longer, aren't they? Absolutely. I think, I think, you know, from the perspective of as a, you know, somebody who's going to reach out and find new talent, it is really important that you create the environment that they can develop and make mistakes. Because, you know, if you find people who are, I mean, all authors are self-critical, let's be honest. We <laughs> we spend um, the majority of our lives in a, in a fug of I'm not good enough. And uh, what you need to do is create a support system around, uh, you know, if you're signing somebody up that can can feel that, you know, they can experiment. Otherwise, you're just going to get, uh, you know, formulaic, sterile, uh, you know, inauthentic voices appearing in print and and, and uh, in ebook and on audiobook. And I, I think that's the only way forward. However, I think the traditional press, like it is in the in the broadcast media, which I, I've uh, and currently in the process of escaping from, um, the fact is that it feels like the disruption that digital providers have created in terms of publishing and in terms of broadcasting has had such a profound effect that everyone is obsessed with a hit. You know, it has to be immediate. Mm. Nothing is supported anymore. No. Well, the industry is uh, it's changing in many ways, I guess. So, um, yeah, it's something we've all got to um, got to keep our, our eyes open to. Um, 
I had my eyes open uh, this week, thankfully, when I was watching um, The Heist on Sky. And that is possibly the worst segue I've ever done in my broadcasting <laughs> career. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so I was watching The Heist on Sky One. Um, it's the second series, um, which has just landed there. You can download and watch the, the entire lot. Um, recommend starting with series one. Um, essentially, um, what happens is... There's. Have you seen Hunted, Adrian? It's a bit like that. Uh, I haven't actually. You know that's um... okay. Okay. Well, the heist is. Um, we have nine in this series. Um, ordinary members of the public have signed up to take part in this heist, um, which is uh, in Annick in Northumberland. They've, um, they've, they've essentially Sky has set up um, a bank uh, a fake bank in the town and uh, these nine people have to uh, perform a heist much in the Hatton Garden style um, they're given time to prepare and to do it and when the heist is uh, is over and um, they've they've taken the money they then have to go um, essentially on the run or hide the money uh, for three weeks and they've got a team of detectives um, some of the top people from the Met and from special branch and all, all sorts who are kind of involved and retired and, and, and currently working ones um, to catch the people who have done it. They, the coppers don't know anything until the event happens um, and you then follow their investigation as they're trying to find out who the people are and try to track them down and catch them. And you're also following the uh, members of the public who have carried out the heist and how they're trying to kind of lie low and evade capture and what they're doing in order to hide the money and, and throw the police off the scent. Um, and it, it's fascinating, actually, to see um, how the investigation develops and what these people do to try and get away with it. Um, so there was, as I said, there was nine people. They stole a million pounds um, of real money, which Sky had put in this in this vault, wow. and and split it nine ways. So they had a, like one hundred and ten thousand pounds each, um, and if they can manage to avoid um, being uh, charged within three weeks, they get to keep um, the money. Get to keep what's left. So. Um, Really, really interesting. Um, being arrested is is fine. You can be arrested as long as you manage to to get yourself out of it. If they get, gain enough evidence um, to charge you, then uh, then you get caught and you have to forfeit all of the money that you've stolen. It's a, it's a fascinating concept. It's really good fun to watch as well and um, very interesting. So I highly recommend the heist on Sky. Isn't it a bit of a giveaway though? If you've got a camera crew following the uh, the criminals. <laughs> 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 well this is yeah this is something I've, I've wondered i know that's something that happens on on hunted which um it's a similar kind of thing you have fugitives who haven't actually committed a crime um who are being chased down by the team and yeah, yeah being followed around by a cameraman is, is not ideal especially when that cameraman is uh, is dobbing you into the producers when you, you you manage to get um perhaps when you're a little bit too good <laughs> they yeah. can capture the cameraman uh, it, it has been known that they do fire texts to the uh, to the production team to say you might want to look in this area um yeah it, it, it's, it's an interesting concept there's a lot of kind of hidden camera work and things that are done mm. um and it, it, it really is fascinating to watch the um to, to watch this this process unfold so yeah, i highly recommend um, both hunted on channel four which we talked about before on partners in crime and uh, and the heist on sky um but I'm pretty much covered for this week, actually. You are. I am. Yes, Good. I was. Going uh, to I was going to say. To... I was sorry. I was going to suggest just on the hidden camera thing, just as a, by way of an anecdote before we go. Uh, I have a friend who used to um, be the executive producer on The Real Hustle, if you remember it, on, on the BBC, which was when they used to have uh, these three characters who would show you what real scammers do, and one of the most popular scams that people fall victim to involves cash machines and that is that they put a uh, a special device in the slot which captures your card and then someone behind you observes what your pin number is and it looks like the machine has swallowed your card then that person goes in picks out the card and takes your money and martin mm. uh, has you know been doing these shows for years actually caught somebody pulling off that scam for real because there was a woman in front of him in the queue for the uh, cash machine, 
the card disappeared mm. and he knew exactly how to use um i can't remember what he device it was it's not tweezers or something he was carrying he managed to get the device out and capture and get the police to take the scammer so you know wow. just goes to show hidden camera shows have their uses well yeah that's um <laughs> yeah very interesting and um the chances of that happening are got to be pretty slim but yeah well done to him for uh for catching that criminal um as i say i think i'm probably gonna leave things there because we have had um a short report sent to us from bob up in edinburgh um so i'm going to tack that on the end of this show um and be completely honest in saying that i can't remember if he's back next week or not um things have been a bit up in the air with me i've been trying to get my my new book ready closer to you new psychological thriller which is out on the 25th of this month so um if you want to get a copy of that you can pre-order it now that's going to be um at half price until the, the launch date to get hold of that um all books we recommend of course that you get from our wonderful sponsors kobo if you head over to kobo.com um, find the book you're looking to buy if it's the first one you bought from there enter the promo code crime at the checkout and they'll give you 90 percent off and uh you can enter the promo code partners to get 40 percent off of selected books moving forward um are you done adrian i am i am excellent in that case um we will let bob Close this week's show from Edinburgh. Greetings from Princess Street Gardens in the heart of the mighty city of Edinburgh in Scotland. I'm talking to you uh, just below them, wonderful Edinburgh Castle, home of the great tattoo every year and many other splendid uh, historical things. Uh, above me is Princess Street itself, ooh, and the rattle of, of trams and the busy noise of, of people enjoying the commerce uh, and uh, of its wonderful shops. And to the other side of me, uh, high up, is the beginning of the Royal Mile, and it will go for a mile, would you believe, down towards the Scottish uh, Parliament buildings and the Royal Palace of Holyrood. It really is a wonderful spot. I got off the train here on Monday and I realised, uh, to my surprise and no little horror, uh, that I first made that journey and first arrived in Edinburgh 40 years ago to become a member of the Royal Lyceum Theatre Company, uh, where I stayed uh, on and off for three years, three very happy years. So I got to know this city very well, the Athens of the North, as it is called. So this is just a brief report, really. What's this got to do with crime fiction, you may ask? Well, this morning I've wandered past the Elephant Room uh, in the heart of uh, uh, Edinburgh, where once, many years ago, a young J.K. Rowling sat and plotted out what would become the odyssey uh, of the Harry Potter novels and films. Uh, little did she know the fame and joy she would bring to many readers uh, throughout uh, the world. Uh, and who knew then that inside her there was a crime fiction writer keen to create Cormoran Strike, the hero protagonist of uh, detective thriller novels written under the name, of course, of Robert Galbraith. But when one thinks of Edinburgh, uh, the first name that comes to mind has to be Detective John Rebus, the extraordinary legendary creation of uh, Ian Rankin. Uh, Ian Rankin in 1985 sat in his bedsit in Arden Street, um, which is just a stone throw from the theatre that I'm working in at the moment, the, the lovely King's Theatre, and thought to himself, well, Oxford's got Morse. Maybe Edinburgh should have a detective too. And he set about creating the stories of John Rebus. Um, thank goodness, uh, one of my favourite detectives, the curmudgeonly, cynical, hard-drinking, tough Edinburgh detective. Uh, who uh, was born in Fife, I say, as if he's a real person, because in the minds of many people, uh, John Rebus clearly is, uh, and came to Edinburgh to be a policeman. So, uh, yes, uh, so here I am, and reveling in that, and you can see what a wonderful city it would be to set a, uh, a detective uh, uh, series, a detective uh, novel. Uh, it's got everything. It's got beauty. It's got the most wonderful architecture. It's got grandeur. It's got 
Oh, it's got absolutely everything. There, Edinburgh, uh, and I'm sure many of you have, have been there, but if, those who haven't, it's you must come and, and visit it. It is the most extraordinary international city. It's got everything here. The arts are, are very well supported. Uh, uh, the people are very, 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 very friendly. Uh, and on this particular day, with bright blue February skies, with perfect views to the north across the Fife towards... Uh, uh, across the Firth towards uh, Perth, Sharon and Fife. It really is a, a magnificent spot and I'm very, very privileged to be spending time here. So I'm going to go down and uh, potter around a few bookshops now and uh, I will leave it to my partner, Adam Croft, to recommend the very latest Cormorant Strike uh, by Robert Galbraith, a.k.a. Rowling, and the very latest... Uh, John Rebus novel. John Rebus, if you follow the series, is now a consultant detective because he's a man of a certain age, which is an interesting uh, spin on uh, the other novels that which works uh, particularly well. So, uh, to give you some advice on where you might get the very latest uh, Rankin and Galbraith books uh, to feed your lovely, lovely appetite for crime fiction, I'll hand you back to the studio. I've wanted to say that for years. I'll hand you back to the studio and Mr Croft. Cheerio, hoots more. Thanks, Bob. Well, bye then. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Not the other one. And produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Bache. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop. Perfected. Perfected.